please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome for our guest, Mr. Parker. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon. You can hear me okay? Great, great. Well, I'm going to take a seat if you don't mind. Uh, so I, I'd like to think of this as a nice little chat. Uh, I'd like to chat with you a bit about uh, a bit of my journey. I was told to talk a, a little bit about my story, how I developed my leadership style and approach and uh, use this as an opportunity to foster communication, tell you a little bit about that journey, and then uh, hopefully talk a little bit about things that we can do working together to deal with one of the things that I like the most to talk about, and that is income inequality and how goodwill has become the platform for me to do that. So I'll start, like most journeys, uh, talking about where, sort of where I began. I uh, am from Petersburg, Virginia, uh, a high school uh, just about 20 miles south of the state capital of Richmond, Virginia. And it was, th this high school effectively was a place where I first learned leadership. And why I think that's very important is that uh, my first, first chance at uh, becoming a leader was leading a group uh, uh, known as Gentlemen, Athletes, and Scholars that we call the Gas Guys. So we were the sort of glamorized version of hall monitors. And that leadership opportunity was the very first that to this day, and I also like to show this picture uh, because I like to prove to my kids that I once had hair and I could <laughs> actually be kind of cool. Uh, but, but that was the first leadership opportunity I had. And to this day, I've had, I've led, been the chair, been the executive director of something that was volunteer outside of the regular paid job. And I've always believed that if you can run an organization that you're not being compensated for monetarily and take it to the next level, then you can pretty much do anything. And I took that high school spirit into college and this is a picture of me of my uh, fraternity. Uh, I'm the one, th the third one from the back. I uh, became president of the f uh, fraternity and led about six other organizations while I was in undergrad and graduate school. Uh, and again, fostering relationships as well, uh, building up a network already. And that network of folks from leadership helped out a great deal as my career progressed. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. First real job was at the Greater Richmond Transit Company as a $4 an hour intern. Uh, this fellow is Henry Church and became one of my first mentors. Henry was a Harvard MBA, one of the most brilliant folks I've ever run across, and taught me some early principles about what would make a successful leader. First, take care of your people and your team. Second, take care and have an undying passion to, taking, uh, to caring for your customers. And third, if you do the first two, financial results will follow. The first two are necessary to become a sustainable financial organization. And Henry also was a person who threw you into the fire. Uh, so I was, again, an, an intern, and I, I was sitting in my cubicle one day, and he walked past, and he, said, and he walked by me, and, he, and Henry smoked five packs of cigarettes a day. And this was back in a time when people literally uh, could smoke in the offices and, and so on. Uh, so he walked past my uh, office, my off cubicle, uh, and, and ask, so do you know computer mapping? And I said, yes, and I'd never done computer mapping before. Uh, and, and he said, well, I need to help, I need you to uh, graphically represent on a map all the bus stops that we have in, uh, in our transit system. Uh, this was when the Americans with Disabilities Act was first passed and we had to do all this work to get into compliance. So I said, I can take, I'll, I'll handle it, sir. And so he hand, handed me the assignment. And I took it, went to the computer lab, and spent the whole, next three, four days doing that and was able to successfully complete the project. Uh, handed that to him, and he said, great, thank you, submitted it. A couple of weeks later, I went to his office and said, Mr. Church, you know, this went very well. I'd like you to hand me any of these projects that you have that have been sitting around and gathering dust. Uh, and, and he said, okay, well, we're going to keep throwing them at you until you fail. So for the next year, he was throwing major projects my way, and each time I was thankfully able to succeed at them. Uh, and fast forward, I went from $4 an hour intern uh, to the deputy CEO in about a two and a half year period. Uh, and then that leadership experience was one of the things that also taught me the real need to continue to build a network up, and that real leaders are people who have huge teams around them, that no person alone can, success, can successfully run an organization, a company, even a household. 
Uh, and so I started honing my leadership styles and skills and so forth. And uh, did also learning that one or two mentors may not even be enough, that you need a whole multitude of people from different perspectives to mentor you. Uh, and, and from my perspective, just as important as picking out a major, just as important as picking out your spouse, the right people as the right mentors can have an absolutely f profound impact on your life and your life chances. So two of the folks who worked with me was another one of my colleagues in Richmond and another fellow who I met who helped me get my very first job when I was a graduate student and he was one of our speakers. He exchanged, we exchanged information and said, let's stay in touch. And then a, a couple of years later, he helped me find one of my uh, first jobs outside of Richmond. Now, I asked my assistant to uh, put together a, uh, some type of photograph that we could use to show that you don't like to burn bridges. And she came up with this thing that looks like, you know, the entranceway to hell or something. So, but I liked it because it, it's pretty dramatic. And, but the, and the, the point is, and I want to say this to you, particularly as younger folks, there's going to be a time when you are leaving a job and you're going to want to say to your boss, you know, you take this job and you go to you know where and you, you, know, and, and you let them have it. And there's going to be times when you have colleagues and you want to tell them the same sort of thing. There's going to be times when you want to just let that neighbor, whomever, just have it. Don't. You know, people meet, meet that type of energy, that type of negative energy. They try everything they can to combat it with just as much negative energy. And it's much more, much more important to you and your life chances to build a network of, uh, of alliances than they are of adversaries. And you never know when that person may come along who can help you in your career aspirations. For me, I learned that pretty early on. Uh, when I went to Richmond working for the, the Greater Richmond Transit Company as the intern, the person I reported to directly, we didn't get along almost from day one. She had me fetching her uh, donuts and dry cleaning and doing all those sorts of things. Never felt like it was anything meaningful. But years later, when I was applying for a job for my first CEO position, uh, uh, we had patched up that relationship. I made it a point to go out and talk to her. And when the recruiter was looking for someone for that particular position, she recommended me. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, again, that power of networking. To me, it has made me recession proof that to this day I've had the great pleasure and joy of never having to apply for a job. At every position I've ever had, from running a billion dollar company to running relatively small companies, I've had them through people who knew me recommending me to headhunters, recruiters, HR departments, you, you name it. But never once have I had to cold call someone asking them to consider me, or here's my resume through some blind email or whatnot. And I give all that to networking and mentoring, because as, as long as you have something to teach and something to learn, you are a good mentor or mentee. And the networking component is just a piece of what's necessary so people know your story and know what you're capable of bringing to the table. So my journey has taken me all over the country. I have uh, started out in Richmond, Virginia, as I said, and then moved to California for a short time, moved back to uh, Richmond uh, to become that deputy CEO, as I, as I mentioned, left Virginia to move out to Washington State at the tender age of 30 to become uh, a CEO for the first time out there, uh, left Washington State to move to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I uh, was a deputy city manager and also had the opportunity to uh, run the transit authority there, left Charlotte to become the CEO of the transit system in Vancouver, Washington, and then left Washington, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, left, left Charlotte to go to San Antonio and left San Antonio to move to Atlanta. So that either says that I am high in demand or I simply cannot hold on to a job. So it, it, it's, it's one or the other. Um, and along the way, I had a chance to meet some incredible leaders in all these different cities and so forth. Uh, when I was in Richmond, there was a city council member who became very interested in transportation, a fellow by the name of Tim Kaine. And uh, uh, Tim Kaine, the, the name I imagine may mean a little bit to a few of you. So he went on to become mayor of the city of Richmond and then senator. And of course, just a couple of years ago, was the vice presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And today he remains as a state senator. Uh, moving on to Charlotte, uh, the, the mayor there was uh, Pat McCrory when I, when I first moved, and Pat went on to become the chairman of, my, of the transit authority. Uh, the way the system worked there, he became my boss, my, the chairman of the board, and of course he went on to become governor of North Carolina. 
Another fellow who served as mayor, he joined the Charlotte City Council uh, at a relatively young age and worked on a number of different projects together. Uh, he ultimately became mayor of Charlotte as well, and then President Obama appointed Anthony Fox as the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's always cool when people, when, when you leave places, you saw that map, I've left a lot of places. And whenever I leave, the media sort of jumps in and they go out and talk to people and ask, well, what, what are you going to miss the most about, uh, about Keith Parker? And Mayor, Mayor, he was then Mayor Fox said, well, uh, in conversations with Keith, Keith's a really strong communicator because he makes it a point to listen at least 75% of the time. And that's made him a very effective communicator for us. So I thought there was a neat thing to say. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, another mayor while I was in Charlotte, I'm sorry, he became mayor after I left, but was a, was a friend, was Pat Cannon. And Pat started out in public, public safety side of things. And I always show this photo because Pat made some real big mistakes once he became uh, the, the mayor. He actually took a bribe. He pled guilty to taking a uh, bribe and ended up in prison for a number of years. He's turned his life around. Uh, and so we're proud of the fact that he was able to do that. But I say there's quite often people who are trying to tempt you, especially as you are moving up in the world. And lots of you are going to be running organizations and running companies. And folks will have every type of enticing, shortcut way to get there. And Pat is a good example of why you don't do that. The other reason I really like to show this picture is that hat is so cool <laughs> that I'm wearing there. And I had that hat for 12 years, and I lost it on a martyr train of, of all places to lose it. I'm still getting over it. Um, the other cool thing about Charlotte, though, when I left there, um, they asked a small town mayor what, uh, what he would miss most about me. And he said, well, I like Keith's whole package as a leader. In fact, if I were to die, I would want Keith to marry my wife. <laughs> now, I had never seen his wife, so I was a little reluctant there, but I was also already married. So, so good compliment, but you know. And then in San Antonio, anybody recognize this fella? So he was a mayor. I joined, uh, I moved to San Antonio, I moved to San Antonio in 2009. Uh, just a month later, Julian Castro became uh, the mayor of San Antonio. He, his career took off. We worked on a number of projects together while we were in San Antonio. His career took off and eventually he became the first Hispanic keynote speaker for the Democratic National Convention. Uh, and then President Obama named him to a, secret, I'm sorry, to a cabinet level position. He became Secretary of HUD. And I heard a couple of people murmuring in the background that he is now a presidential candidate, one of, I think, the 75 Democrats who are, are, are running. And then the, the guy who I like the most, of all the folks I've had a chance to sit down with and hear from and so on, uh, and this was a really neat, neat opportunity to sit with President Carter and hear him start off the meeting by saying, hey, look, I don't want you to have any crazy expectations because uh, I, I don't remember a lot about how MARTA was formed and all those early days, so don't expect that. And then we sat there and had this long conversation. He remembered everything. He was talking about uh, uh, state legislative meetings and na naming the door he went in and the number of people who were in the meetings and what they said and how they said it. And it was amazing how much passion he still has for transportation and talked about how transportation is transforming lives all around the world and has been one of those major things people have used to oppress folks as well. So it was a great, fruitful conversation. And part of my strategy has always been to be bipartisan, whether it was in Washington State, Texas, Virginia, here in Georgia, to always have positive relationships with po folks on both the left and the right side of the aisle. So have great relationships to this day with people like our new uh, mayor, uh, Keisha Lyons Bottoms, with Governor Kemp, with former Governor Deal, with uh, 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 Speaker Ralston with Johnny Isaacson, of course, John Lewis, the congressman, and then used to literally have breakfast two or three times a year with Stacey Abrams, who, of course, was the uh, runner-up in the gubernatorial uh, uh, election just recently. So very, very positive relationships all across the board, and these are the things that I would always advocate to you as well. You can be uh, very strongly partisan in, on one issue or another, but there's always going to be some things you can agree with folks on the other side with. Build on those things and let the other pieces fall to the wayside when you don't have to argue about them. So the power of leadership is also about helping others. 
And that is the piece of my career that I actually am most proud of, is the number of people I've had a chance to work with who have gone on to do some incredible things. So all around the country, people who have worked on my teams are now running things of their own. Uh, the first one was in Washington State. This is Gail Spoler. She was one of my deputies, and she went on to run the system after I left. But Gail was just, again, the first of uh, quite a few. Matt Tucker worked with me when uh, we were in Richmond, and now he runs the Transit Authority out in San Diego. Uh, Katrina Heineken was a part of our team in Charlotte. She runs an authority in Arizona. Uh, Elizabeth Sudi runs the uh, authority in Des Moines, Iowa. And on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So all told right now, I have about 15 folks who either have led or are leading a transit authority or a local government of some type of their own. And I think this has become a tremendous marketing tool for me because when folks are interviewing with me and I tell them my job, my goal is not to fulfill my dreams through you, it is for you to fulfill your dreams. And so let's walk, walk, work through what you want to accomplish while you're here, but just as importantly, what you want to accomplish long term. The guy who I was most uh, impressed with of all the folks who have gone on to do great things was this gentleman who when I was in Richmond, and I was all of 26 years old and was a deputy CEO of the, CEO of the authority then, and he and I went to breakfast uh, one morning and he laid out to me what his aspirations were. And he said, basically, I'm ready to retire. I'm 56, I've already worked for 30 years, and my education probably won't allow me to move up any further in the organization, so it's just time for me to go. I was able to talk him out of it, and then uh, we laid out the career path, and at the tender age of 71, he became the CEO of the Greater Richmond Transit Company and did some really wonderful things while I was there and already named buildings after him and all those other things. So uh, never too late for you to really go after your dreams. So the move to Atlanta was an interesting one. Uh, in San Antonio, we had set records for ridership. We had done a, done a whole host of things, uh, became one of the very first systems in the country to put Wi-Fi on transit vehicles. Uh, we went to an all-electric group of uh, buses, one of the first groups to ever do that. And as a result, we saw our fortunes really, really rise. The board there had put an offer on the table to make me the highest paid transit director in the country and uh, pretty much made it foolproof that anything I could have done wrong, they still would have paid me out, uh, just saying, you, you, you're here, we're committed to you. And then I thought about, so then the Atlanta thing came up. A recruiter called me up and said, uh, hey, look, these folks in Atlanta want to talk to you about potentially running their system. Now, the Atlanta system is interesting. Um, it is just a few factoids. It's one of the largest transit systems in the country with subways and buses and all those things. How many of you have ridden MARTA? Okay, yeah, most of you have ridden the system. Uh, and carried at its uh, apex about 150, 354 million people uh, a year. And the system, of course, was uh, started up around the same time as San Francisco and D.C. started their systems. Uh, those systems have gone on to become much larger and, and so forth, while the MARTA system has generally stayed the same. Uh, now, now, that's the good part that I'm mentioning, those things about MARTA. So when they called me about the job, uh, effectively in the transit, of, transit industry, MARTA was recognized as the worst place to work for a CEO in the entire industry. And these are some of the headlines that were around. MARTA, where it all went wrong. You know, this is what I was reading when I was thinking about the job. MARTA, voters reject the transportation tax. Any of you were here back in 2012 when they had this huge uh, uh, transportation initiative? for the region? Well, it was pretty bad. Uh, the agency not only lost, but it lost by a two to one margin in almost every county in, in the state. And then, of course, MARTA was going through some terrible times in terms of having to cut its budget, uh, not being able uh, to pay the employees well. Most of the employees had only had uh, one raise in the previous 10 years. Customer service numbers were terrible. And all the media coverage uh, they monetized their media coverage, and they found that by a six-to-one margin, folk, there were negative articles and news stories coming out there for every positive article. So six-to-one margin, negative to positive. And if you monetize that number, it was worth over $3.5 million worth of free negative coverage that they were receiving. Uh, and then on my first day, first day on the job, December, 13, uh, December 10th, 2013, I'm sorry, December 10th, 2012, the CFO comes in and hands me 
this chart. And he goes, Keith, this was done by the auditing firm KPMG, and it is indicating that we're losing between 25 and $33 million a year. We will be fiscally bankrupt around April of 2017. And uh, welcome to Marta. And I will be resigning at the end of the month. And that's what he told me <laughs> at, the, at that first meeting. Uh, so we immediately started to put together a plan of how we're going to transform the system. I'm a big believer in strategic plans. So we put together the Marta Transportation Initiative, which was a five-year blueprint to get the agency into financial solvency and meet all these other uh, objectives. Going back to what Henry Church told me when, uh, as my mentor, how do we do it? Got to take care of the team have an undying quench for taking care of your customers and the financial results will take care of themselves. The, the first part of that was to make people feeling safe about riding the system. So we came up with what we call the ride respect, uh, zero tolerance approach to uncivil behavior on the transit buses and, and trains. And as a result, we saw the amount of that type of uncivil behavior dramatically drop. This is a chart comparing MARTA with the other larger transit authorities in the country. And you'll see after just a couple of years, we became the second safest large transit system in the country as, uh, as compared using uh, uh, tier one crimes. Uh, we really wanted to capitalize off of the good news of MARTA. So part of my objective was to have highlighted by the media one major positive story every single month. And this was one of them, that the MARTA train service to the airport is the best in the country, where you can go from the Delta or Southwest uh, baggage claim to the rail platform in less than three minutes and 16 minutes later be downtown with a 97% on-time uh, performance. We also were one of the first transit systems in the country to start partnering with Uber and Lyft. We set up agreements so that, uh, for example, during the bridge collapse and the fire, you would get a half price ride on Uber or Lyft if you were using that ride to get to the train station or from the train station. And we also set up a partnership with the city's bicycle program to put bikes in, and, uh, in uh, most, of the most of the train stations within the city. And we went out to the West End uh, train station and asked folks, what would you like to see in the train station? What type of amenities would you like to, uh, like to see here? And one of the things that came back was a big surprise. They said that they were practically a food desert, that they wanted access to fresh fr uh, fruit and vegetables. So the West End Station became the first one. We put a farmer's market, and now there are about six of them uh, throughout the modern network, making us the largest of those type of providers anywhere in the country. And then, of course, uh, we wanted, again, keep it fresh, come up with lots of new and different things. Uh, soccer in the streets, we became the first transit system in the world to have a soccer field inside a train station. So this is at the Five Point Station, uh, and there's soccer going on there from basically early morning all the way until midnight. Uh, and we also made sure that we uh, uh, incorporated leagues that allowed uh, underprivileged kids to utilize this, uh, this soccer field as, as well. And so we, again, wanted to really change the dialogue so that people started reading about MARTA and hearing all this good news, all these great things that the transit system was doing, instead of constantly hearing woe is me stories about how bad the transit system was performing. And then the financial results really began to turn around. So as I mentioned, the CFO mentioned, uh, told me that, hey, look, we were losing $33 million that first year. Uh, within six months, we turned that $33 million projected deficit into a $9 million surplus. And every year that I was there, we were able to add somewhere between $25 and $40 million to our budget reserves. So by the time I left, instead of being fiscally bankrupt, as KPMG had proje uh, projected, I left them with about a quarter of a billion dollars in, in budget reserves. Uh, and that led to a ton of accolades for the transit system, for me personally, and so on. So it really started to go well. Uh, suddenly, people from all over the country were visiting MARTA, wanted to know how we had made this massive turnaround. How do we do it? How does this thing work? Uh, in, uh, uh, in total, I think I won about 40 different awards. The agency won a gazillion different things. Uh, and one of them uh, that really stood out was for our urine detection device. So, yes. Urine detection device. So uh, July 4th, 2014, I'm uh, uh, in one of our elevators with my wife and three kids. And so a whole group of people come on, including this lady from New York, who walked on and there was an obvious smell of urine inside our elevator. 
And she said, what in the world is this smell? This is terrible. You know, I, I'm from New York, and I just need to bring some of the New York people down here to show you all how to run a transit system. I'm like, all right, just go ahead and kill me slowly in front of my children. <laughs> So I went to our guys and, and uh, the rest of our engineers and said, we need to do something about this. So they came up with the urine detection devices. So if you were to relieve yourself in one of these uh, so equipped elevators, uh, strobe light comes on and the door closes and it sends off an alarm. The door closes and holds you there until the police department comes to pick you up. Uh, and we, thankfully, once we did this, we only had to make one arrest for it because the word got around. But this thing took on an absolute international fervor where the BBC covered it. Breitbart News, and when has Breitbart ever had a story about transit elevators? You know? But Breitbart covered it. Good Morning America, all around they covered this thing. Uh, and then some of the headlines were really iffy, I, I, I'd say. Uh, uh, there was one that said, Marta, I see you pee. <laughs> and then Marta, looking out for number one. You know, uh, <laughs> it, it, it only gets worse from there. But we won Elevator Magazine's Innovation of the World. Now, I'm sure, <laughs> I, I'm sure a lot of you have Elevator Magazine on your, on your nice hands. Uh, but of all the awards we won, again, yeah, that one stood out the most. Uh, and I'm really thrilled about where the agency is now and the fact that it is poised for major expansion. So the big vote is coming up in just a few weeks out in Gwinnett. MARTA had not passed a single referendum of any type for 40 years until our team came in and we passed a referendum extending service out to Clayton County with 74% of the vote and then also a City of Atlanta referendum to expand service within the city. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that momentum continues. Uh, so with all that good stuff happening at MARTA, why in the world would I leave and join Goodwill? Uh, I think this video from this friend of ours named Nigel can help begin to tell the story. Goodwill gives me motivation to work. Goodwill Industries gives me hope. Goodwill gives me skills and experience. I do custodian. The thing I do is I vacuum, clear the trash, sweep, and mop the floor. And I clean the elevator and the glass door. Good for that train me how to clean and do all the machines. I'm Nigel's mother and uh we were already close, he's my only child. So he started speaking a little tiny bit when he was 10 years old. And then uh, he didn't progress really well. But uh, recently, he's been making strides and I've given them uh, the kind of support that they need. I think this job, there is a lot of support at all levels. From the beginning with the training, the recruitment and the training, and helping him to find a company to support him, because that was a requirement. And all the way up to where he is now. I'm really enjoying the CDC campus. The thing I like about my job is I like to get holiday all and get time off. And I'm really getting along with my supervisor and my manager. And I'm getting along with other people who have disability. I want to spend my life and move, live fast, and get the job done. Google gives me peace of mind. Gives me reassurance that my son is going to have a decent life. It gives me a feeling of strong support coming from his supervisors and the whole Goodwill team. And you can't buy that anywhere. What more could you wish for for your child that needs so much help and is operating almost independently now because he's gotten the kind of support he needed to foster that kind of independence? So I know when I'm working at the right place is when I would do it for free. And goodwill gives you that type of feeling. Nigel is one of 100,000 people who have helped find jobs 
over the last five years. And that's what we do. Our mission is to put people to work. No matter what your background, no matter what your challenges may have been, Goodwill helps you find employment. And we do, we've done it and become a major uh, driver of the economy. We are approaching a $1 billion annual impact on the economy of Georgia. Uh, we also have be become really adept at the education space. That students who go through Goodwill and partner with a number of the 26 different high schools where we uh, provide some support, students graduate at almost a 99% rate. And at a 100% rate, they either go on to college or we help them find employment. And on the environmental side, we have become one of the real heavyweights that uh, we help divert almost 50 million pounds of items that have otherwise, would have otherwise ended up in the landfills. So how do we do it? Folks like you make donations of your lightly used goods to our stores or our donation centers. We take those and process them and turn them into profit and use a profit from those stores to help people find jobs uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, North Georgia region. Our brand is one of the most positive in the entire country, in fact, in the entire world. The World Brand uh, Index does this uh, evaluation every other year, and we are now the fourth most valuable brand anywhere in the world. And we're just not stopping on our laurels. This is a picture of our most recent store we built out in Hartwell, Georgia. And it compares favorably, I would say, to any Steinmart or Marshalls, any of those type places. Uh, we're creating a first-class shopper experience for all of our folks. So we're dabbling now into e-commerce for the first time and just doing a whole host of things to dramatically change the perception that people may have of thrift shopping and instead letting them know all the positive things about recyclables and, and reusing items that real, uh, still have a purpose. Our 2023 plan is one of the most aggressive of any of the nonprofits uh, in the nation. I projected that we are going to have about a 70% level of revenue growth. We're going to continue to grow the number of people who, uh, who we're helping to find jobs, and we're going to do it while becoming the most efficient nonprofit really anywhere in the country with an overhead rate below 7%. So with that, I think it's, we may have a moment or two uh, to take a question, but I do thank you for your time and hope you've enjoyed our presentation. Deluca, MBA class of 2020. Uh, I had a question about the political side of your job. Because in my family, some people were CEOs and by nature of the industry they're working in, they had a pre political job and they hated it, especially during the alternance between one party to another. Um, so did you like it first? And then did you see that as an obstacle to you running your operations as a CEO? So if I heard your question correctly, it was, did I like the political parts of the job? My, that same fellow, Henry Church, who I mentioned earlier, said that as long as the job was 90% operational and only 10% politics, he could do it. In today's world, the job is 90% operational, 90% political, 90% customer service, it's all of them. And if you're not comfortable with the political part, absolutely do not take on a job like Marta. I enjoyed the politics because I enjoyed doing the th things that we needed to do. What I found was uh, we had to find common ground with whether they were independents, uh, libertarian, Republican, Democrat, what have you. If you show meaningful results, you can win allies. When, so I'll tell you a quick, quick story. When, I took the, when it was announced that I was one of the finalists for the position, a state legislator came out to a uh, cave, talked to a... Uh, newspaper reporter and said that he did not want me to get the job. In fact, that he would do everything he could to make sure I didn't get the job. And told the board of directors if they hired me, that they would have a very foster relationship with the state legislature. And he was the chairman of the oversight committee at the state that provides oversight over MARTA. So it's like another welcome to Georgia moment. Uh, but we met with him and we were able to transform the agency pretty quickly, and the following year, he wrote an op-ed to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution saying he was wrong and that uh, Marta made the right decision in hiring me. It's very rare that you get a politician to go on the record to say I was wrong about something, but yes, the politics, if you're not comfortable with that, don't get into government work. Thanks for being with us, Keith. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm uh, also a first-year MBA. Uh, 
you've gotten you've had a lot of experience uh, working in, in different urban areas around the United States, and mm -hmm. I know that cities often you know people from cities often like to say, oh, our city is the worst for traffic, or our city is the worst for housing crisis or unemployment. Um, and I'm curious, in your perspective, having having you know been to a lot of different cities, wh what do you think are the unique challenges to Atlanta um, that that uh, that we need to solve for moving forward? That's an excellent question. In fact, I have lived in a number of those the worst cities. So in Richmond, Virginia, when I was an undergrad, Richmond was the murder capital of the country. For per capita murders, it was number one. Uh, San Antonio was number one in obesity uh, while I was there. So it had a big problem. Oh, come on. <laughs> you guys are slow. Uh, uh, and, but Atlanta does have a peculiar problem. So if I were to tell you that Atlanta is, tell me which one of, of these things are true. Atlanta is often seen as the number one place for African Americans to live in the country. Atlanta is often seen as the number one place for gay people to live in the country. And Atlanta leads the country in income inequality. Which one of those are true? All three are true. Um, and so next month, we are hosting a forum, a panel discussion, a goodwill is, that will talk about it. The title of it, is, the working title is Prosperity for All, How to Reduce the Income Gap, or How to Reduce the Wealth Gap in Atlanta. And on our panel will be Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, the chair of the Atlanta Fed, uh, Raphael Bostic, the, chair, uh, the CEO of the um, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, Halo Matamog, and it'll be moderated by Rose Scott uh, from NPR. And we will live stream it, so hopefully all of you have a chance to listen to it. But this is something we're taking on as our number one passion outside of putting people to work is putting people to work in middle class and, and higher jobs so we can help eliminate or at least start to solve that problem of income inequality in Atlanta. Do you know that in some neighborhoods in Atlanta, if you're born in that neighborhood, you have a 96% chance of being born in poverty and dying in poverty? Uh, worse in the nation. So that is something that we need to change about our city. Um, hi, Henry McGill, first year MBA as well. Uh, so you, as, with the turnaround of MARTA and the increase of uh, public transportation use that seems to be going around the country, how do you see, do you see opportunity, obviously there's opportunities for us to expand MARTA, what are the roadblocks and do you see that happening and us overcoming that in the near future? Excuse me. Excellent question. Um, as I mentioned, Mar had not passed any type of referendum to expand service for 40 years. And we were very fortunate and able to do that. In fact, Clayton County, just two years prior, in 2012, they voted two to one against uh, transportation improvements in, in the county and then voted by a three to one margin to join MART and become part of the program. The momentum has clearly been here, and, and a big part of that was to change the perception that people had of the transit agency. Uh, so what I'm hearing in Gwinnett is that it is a neck, it's, it's gonna be neck and neck, uh, but it's old attitudes and perceptions die hard. You know, so there's still folks out there who believe that if you extend the train that there'll be people who will take a train, ride out to Gwinnett, steal the television out of their bedroom, and then get back on the train and come back to downtown Atlanta. You still have folks who, who, who believe those sorts of things. Uh, so I know there, there's a campaign going on trying to eliminate some of those uh, incorrect perceptions. Uh, from a national standpoint, there has been massive investment in the last few years. Uh, California passed a $120 billion investment to expand transit in the LA area, San Francisco also, Seattle passed a big referendum recently. So Atlanta could be the next one to take the right step. Hey Keith, uh, Matt Arkin, uh, tech alum. Uh, you mentioned about Goodwill's role in education. And, mm -hmm. you know, nationally, Goodwill has really been very innovative in education. Uh, opening and managing charter schools in some states, and I think it's, I read recently, the second largest online education provider in the country. Um, can you talk about kind of 
the, the approach you see Goodwill of North Georgia taking? Yes. So we have tremendous partnerships with a number of technical colleges and Georgia Tech, as a matter of fact. Just, just recently, one of your subsidiary organizations, TechBridge, uh, we partnered with them beginning last January. And with this partnership, we helped 30 or so 18 to 24 year olds who had some type of disadvantage in their, in, in their background, some type of barrier in their, in their background, put them through 16 weeks of training and they came out with different types of certifications in IT and um, almost immediately found all of them jobs. We repeated that with a group out in Cobb County and going to continue to do it. And, and we also have partnerships with a whole host of technical colleges. The graduation rate for uh, uh, just the overall graduation rate for technical colleges in the state of Georgia is about 15 to 20 percent. For students who partner with Goodwill, and we have this specific role where we play with technical college students, the graduation rates for those uh, students is 85 percent. So we are very good at the soft skill thing of teaching people all the little things that get in the way called life. Uh, about how to deal with these little crises that may come up and help them navigate those things so they can uh, fulfill their dreams. Uh, we're, so we're doing it at the technical college level, we're doing it in high schools, and we're going to continue to provide different types of training. For example, like you saw Nigel there, he did not have to go through the intensive training some of our folks require. Uh, some of our uh, people, when they come through the program, they need as much as three, four months of training, and we will provide that for them. For example, we have this uh, uh, program for women in non-traditional careers, like uh, getting women into construction and working for GDOT and so on. And during that 16 weeks of training, we pay them as well, because if you tell a person who's working paycheck to paycheck, stop earning a living for three months, you may as well tell them walk to the moon. Uh, so instead, we try to remove all those barriers and get them uh, onto their path of reaching all their dreams. There's a gentleman right here, then another fellow with my fondness for purple. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my question is about Goodwill. When, when you uh, left San Antonio to go to MARTA, obviously MARTA was in deep trouble and you led a turnaround effort there. Is there a similar situation at Goodwill in North Georgia? Are there issues there? Is that why? I know you came because of the mission, so to speak, mm -hmm. but are there also uh, serious issues that you're dealing with? And, and if you are, how are you dealing with them through strategy? Because you did yeah. talk about how important strategy was. Excellent question. And so the two major reasons why I went to Goodwill of North Georgia, one family, one job. Uh, I have a daughter who drove us bananas, and we, uh, she visited 25 different schools as she w was making her college decision and started out by telling us under no circumstance would I go to school in the state of Georgia. Not going to happen. And so we visited all over the place. And uh, we were thinking, so she, she got into Penn State and she got into Pittsburgh. And, and then my choice was my wife's alma mater, William and Mary. So we figured she'd go to one of those schools. Literally almost the last day, she applies to the University of Georgia and then comes back to us and says, I want to go to UGA. <laughs> and I know you all have great fondness for UGA, so I <laughs> wanted to mention that. And, and so I was considering offers in New York and D.C. actually at the time, but when she decided UGA to, and I have uh, two kids uh, younger than her, and part of it was her decision was she wanted to help her uh, little sister and brother uh, as they were growing up. So then dad could not then move the family away. Uh, so knew we had to stay here. The second part, I had already been on the board at Goodwill of San Antonio, Goodwill in of North Georgia and knew a, little, a bit about the mission, but I never thought about working for them until our previous CEO uh, retired after 27 years on the job. And I was going to be on the search committee and the day before the first meeting, the, uh, the chairman of the search committee calls me up and says, Keith, um, you can't come to the meeting uh, because we want you to consider applying. And I said, uh, I guess I'll have to think about it and, and then I'm here. Uh, now, as far as challenges that the organization faces, it does. Uh, like almost all brick and mortar retail, the core, it doesn't look good. Uh, uh, have you heard that uh, this Christmas season that we just finished was one of the worst in the past decade for brick and mortar? 
uh, and lots of stores, whether it's Kohl's or Macy's, and you saw what's happened to Toys R Us and others, they are shutting down or shutting down major uh, groups. So part of what they wanted me to do was help stem that tide because we had seen great fortune for several decades and now things had leveled off. And we've put together a five-year strategic plan, as I mentioned, that's going to get us there. And I always want, like to leave this slide up there. How, how we get there? Absolute devotion to our team, making sure that we got the right people in the right positions to really go out and execute that mission. And then I mentioned a little bit about some of the big customer service improvements we'll be making. And then I think if we do those two things right, the financial results will really come together. I think this fellow is next. Thank you. Uh, yes. My name is Tim. I study material science. So I, I'm here just because I uh, have this deep passion for uh, public transportation. I ride my bike every day. Um, we love question. people like you in transit, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the train. I love Marta. Um, well, my question is more about actually how you realize your strength. Because, I mean, you kind of talked about, like, in high school, you were you had the, the gas guys. But, like, how did mm -hmm. you, I guess, what was, like, the turning point for you? Uh, was it, like, the mentor? Was it in college when you were, like, leading those organizations? But um, it, it wasn't, like, clear for me. Or I guess it might have just right. been, like, a... Well, that's an excellent question, though. Um, the reason why I said go out and volunteer is because leadership takes practice. I've screwed up so many times, it's unbelievable. Uh, and, but what's, fa what's great about screwing up is if you can learn something from it, it was a fall forward. And as long as you're falling forward, you're still making progress. You're still getting towards your goal. Uh, and, and so the two attributes I think far too many aspiring leaders don't know well enough or don't put enough value in is listening, which I talked about a little bit earlier, and humility. How many people have made some really, really stupid decisions because their ego, their hubris, other things got in the way? One of the things my, anybody who works for me, with me, been a part of my team will know I goof up occasionally, and I'm very comfortable with saying it. And, and there's a certain attraction that comes when you are that type of manager, leader, that when people know that if they've made a mistake, they can come to you and, and say, I made a mistake, or I think I'm about to go down the wrong path, let's talk. That opens up communication throughout the organization that's absolutely critical. And again, I learned that through these, in large part through these various volunteer places. The moment for me when I knew I was comfortable with leadership was again in Richmond, and I was still the intern, and both the CEO, the deputy CEO, and most of the leadership was away, and this small crisis had emerged, and so they pulled everybody into our big conference room, and I didn't really belong there, because I was, again, just the intern. And they started articulating the problem, and we, and, and so as the problems were being discussed, I was able to add something in it. And by the time we finished in about 30, 45 minutes of conversation, the question came up, so what do we do? And everyone in the room turned towards me for the answer. And that's when I knew I like this leadership thing and, and I'm going to go for it. Hey, Keith. Uh, Raheem Penny, um, grad student, first year grad student, um, electrical engineering program. So you're a leader, you found out you're a leader, and then you led a certain group and, and then transitioned to other groups. Mm -hmm. What is the first thing you do when you're in a new group, a new leadership position? Oh, excellent question. And, and I've had to do it a few times, <laughs> yes. I've had to do it a few times. So the model I used for MARTA was to get in front of and hear from as many people as possible. So I had the, the a real luxury that I had was when I got the job here, when they announced that I was going to be the CEO here, the folks in San Antonio said, uh, you have to honor your contract. And I had a 90-day uh, notification that I needed to give them. Now, I could have walked away. There's no punishment. I mean, if I had left before that 90 days, uh, there's nothing they could have done about it. However, I think the way you leave is just as important as the way you arrive uh, for a position, so I wanted to honor that. Turned out to be a blessing. So I used that 90 days to finish up all the work I needed to in San Antonio, but also to come to Atlanta uh, quite a few times. And we convened a whole group of roundtables. 
where some of them were with Fortune 500 company leaders, others were with neighborhood association leaders, civil rights groups, and a whole host of other different groups. And I did lots of these things, and, and they were listening sessions. So I literally just sat there and said, I have three questions for you. The first, uh, what do you think of MARTA now? Second, where would you like MARTA to be? And then third, what are you willing to do to help? And so by doing that third question particularly, they became invested in, in my success. They became invested in the agency's success. So we took that, the, the information I got from those three, from those uh, roundtable discussions, and that formulated my first 100-day plan, which was in large part the information that was used to put together the five-year plan. And I constantly call people who were in those roundtables to remind them of some of the things they suggested and to tell them when we were implementing some of those, uh, those components. So it built up this huge network of people who were invested in the transit system, invested, again, in my success personally, and who I could then call for very specific things if we needed help on a particular item or, or matter. So that was the way we approached it uh, in San Antonio, at, at, in, I'm sorry, in, in Atlanta for goodwill. We did a lot of listening as well through town halls with our own employees and, 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 and doing a lot of customer feedback and customer research to find out what we're doing well and what things we need to uh, provide some improvement on. So listening, listening, listening. the last question then Keith and thanks very much for um, I know you had a long day thanks for sticking um, with us till the end of it um, you never said the words diversity and inclusion and you didn't have to um, Nigel story um, was was saying that for you and and I'm sure um, that's very strong at <laughs> at um, goodwill and but keep going I'm listening <laughs> I, I, I want you to talk a little bit to that culture and how do you nurture that culture. Um, we here at, at Georgia Tech have um, an outstanding program. It's called the Excel program for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. and some of them are here um, in the crowd today. And, and we know that as much as working with them, you know, is something that needs to be done and, and it's being done, it's just as important to prepare the employers um, for the world of people with disabilities and inclusion. So if you can talk a little bit to that, um, that would be great. Absolutely. And the reason I pull this picture back up is I want you to see black, white, male, female, Hispanic, there's gay person, uh, whole, all sorts of folks who have worked in our teams have done well. And the reason I don't have to talk about it as much is because we do it. We model it. We do it every, every day. Our leadership team right now uh, looks like America, looks like uh, Atlanta. Uh, and, and, but you do have to be intentional. Absolutely, you have to be intentional. Uh, we don't tolerate, I have a zero tolerance policy uh, in our organization for people who are intolerant, for people who say hurtful things about other folks, for folks who would disparage someone because of their ethnic identity, because of their orientation or what have you. So we just don't do it and we model it and it begins with me. I hold myself accountable more than anything else. Uh, but we are still looking for ways to be even more powerful. So one of the programs we have is called our Facility Services Group. That group goes out and provides the services to help maintain and clean places like the CDC, the Carter Center, and, and, and many others. 90% of the folks who work for us uh, in, in those positions have disabilities. In fact, the majority of them have more than one. And we make sure that we give them an extremely dignified work environment where we provide them with the same level of care and, and, and uh, respect as we would anybody else in our population. And it works. In custodial work generally, there's a two to 300% turnover rate per year. At Goodwill, we have a less than 10% turnover rate per year amongst our disabled colleagues. And I think a big part of that has to do with the culture of the organization and the fact that people know that we are absolutely committed to having a diverse and inclusive work environment and that we're going to model it and do it every single day. Let's give Mr. Parker a big Georgia Tech ovation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.